we're going to study a little bit tonight about the account of the time that Peter walked on the water. A few lessons we can take away from that <coughs> account. The things that we remember about Peter, there's some good things, obviously, that we remember about him. Uh, we remember the great confession there in Matthew chapter 16. Matthew the 16th chapter. Beginning in verse 13, when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And of course, Jesus said that that's the rock upon which the church would be built. Peter makes that great confession. We remember what happened in Acts the second chapter. The first gospel sermon there. Peter was the one who stood up with the eleven and proclaimed the gospel there on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. And that day about 3,000 souls were obedient to that gospel call. We remember his two epistles. The great encouragement that we find there to buck up under persecution in the first letter. And then the second letter, the the warnings against false teachers and those who would scoff the idea of Jesus' return. A lot of positive things when we look at the scriptures about Peter, but there are some negative things as well. Uh, we read about his denial of Jesus in Matthew the 26th chapter. Peter had said, you know, that he would never deny. Him. Though everybody else did, he wouldn't, but we see that uh, as, as Jesus predicted, he would deny. Him. Matthew chapter 26, beginning in verse 69. Now Peter sat outside in the courtyard, and this is after Jesus has been arrested. And a servant girl came to him, saying, You also were with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you are saying. And when he had gone out to the gateway, another girl saw him and said to those who were there, This fellow also was with Jesus of Nazareth. But again he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. A little later those who stood by came up and said to Peter, Surely you also are one of them, for your speech betrays you. Then he began to curse and swear, saying, I do not know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed. Peter remembered the word of Jesus, who had said to him, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So he went out and wept bitterly. Remember that account and how sure Peter was of himself and how he stumbled during that time of, of trial and testing. And we remember what happened in, in Galatians chapter 2, where Paul had to withstand him to his face because he was being a hypocrite. Galatians chapter 2, beginning in verse 11. Galatians chapter 2, beginning in verse 11. Now when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face, because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. And so Paul flatly calls Peter a hypocrite in this instance. We remember a lot about Peter. Another thing we remember is the, the account of when Peter attempted to walk on the water, and that brings us back to Matthew, the 14th chapter. Matthew, chapter 14, beginning in verse 22. Uh, after Jesus had fed the 5,000. Uh, it says, Immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, Come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. 
And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. And so Jesus is, is walking. The disciples are out in the boat. Jesus is walking to them on the water. The winds are, the winds are contrary. You've got winds and waves. And the disciples can't see Jesus walking in the water. And, of course, they were astonished at this and were afraid, thinking it was a ghost. But Jesus said, It's I. And Peter said, Well, if it's you, then you can tell me to come to you. And Jesus said, Come. And Peter got down out of that boat. What great faith it would have taken to step out of that boat and into that rough sea. But that's what Peter did. But he got into the water. And he saw that, hey, this is water, and the winds are blowing hard, and there's waves. And he began to doubt, and he, he began to sink, and he asked Jesus to save him, and he did. And when he did it, they worshipped him as he is, in fact, the Son of God. Well, why is it that Peter sank? It is not because he didn't trust that Jesus had the power. Because Peter got down out of that boat. He stepped out on that one. He knew that Jesus had the ability to have him walk on that water if Jesus so desired. Peter had faith in that. And again, it's not because he didn't have the desire to do it. Because he did. He, he got down out of the boat. And it's not because he was unable. Again, it's the power of Jesus that allowed that to happen. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us, which many abuse that passage and, and apply it to things to which it does not apply. What that means is we can do whatever the Lord wants of us. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. <coughs> the fact is that Peter sank because he became distracted. Verse 30, when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out saying, Lord, save me. He lost sight of Jesus. He began to lose his faith. He became afraid. He was distracted. And there are numerous distractions that come from Satan because he is our adversary. He walks about as a roaring lion and seeking whom he may devour. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. There are many distractions that Satan can throw at us as we go through life. We can become overly concerned with material things. You know, it's very easy to, to look at the world around us and see that there are many who are very prosperous and have all sorts of goods, play things, things that are nice, things that we ourselves might like to have. And it's easy to look around at folks and become envious. It's easy to become uh, consumed with trying to have more and more instead of being content with such as we have. We can become overly concerned with material things. Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. In the Sermon on the Mount, our Savior said, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart is also. There's treasure that's more important than the things of this earth. Jesus asked in Matthew the 16th chapter, what would a man give in exchange for his soul? What is as valuable as, as our eternal destiny? In verse 33, Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you, speaking of food and clothing. Why do you worry about these things, Jesus asked. He says, don't worry about these things. If you seek God first, they're going to be added to you. God is going to take care of you. You can't serve God and mammon, he had said earlier in this chapter. Put God first. These things will take care of themselves because God will take care of them. Chapter 13, verse 22, when Jesus was talking, uh, giving the explanation of the parable of the sower. He says in verse 22 of Matthew, the 13th chapter, Now he who receives seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and choke out the word and he becomes unfruitful. The deceitfulness of riches. They're deceitful. They're temporary. They don't last. It's like the 90th Psalm where Moses said you might get 70 or 80 years. You might obtain all sorts of riches. We might be Bill Gates. We might attain to that level. You know, 25, 30 billion dollars. 
have anything in the world that we want, have that kind of wealth, but what good is it when you're gone? Can you take it with you? The answer is no. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy 6 chapter. Paul says in verse 6, Now godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And that's like the old preacher joke. Do you ever see the, the hearse dragging a U-Haul? You don't. You can't take it with you. Verse 7, verse 8 rather, And having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierce themselves through with many sorrows. We have to be careful that we're not like that, that rich fool in Luke the 12th chapter that saw all of his great possessions and he thought to himself, I'm going to tear down my barns and I'm going to build new barns and I'm going to put all my stuff in these new barns and then I'm going to be satisfied. I'm going to be, have all this laid up for many years and you'll remember what God said to him. This night, your soul is required of you. He called him a fool. He said, whose things are those going to be when you're gone? Jesus said our life does not consist in the things that we possess. We need to be very careful that we're not distracted by that. Satan also throws persecution and tribulation at us to distract us. Troubles in this life. Paul said in, in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and, and verse 12, Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. That, that's the Christian's lot in life, is the expectation of persecution. The health and wealth gospel is false, brethren. Joel Osteen does not tell us the truth. I talk about him because he's the most prominent one of these health and wealth guys these days. If you've ever seen him on TV, he's got that big church down in Houston. They use the old arena where the Houston Rockets used to play. That's where they worship. Massive congregation. Millions and millions of, of dollars that he's made selling books. Millions of copies of books out there. People believe this stuff. And I've, I've read parts of, of uh, I believe it's called Your Best Life Now, something similar to that. And the, one of the first things that he does is tell the story about how he and his wife, when they were poor and didn't have anything, drove by this big fancy house, and they loved this house, and they wanted this house, and so they began to pray for this house. And they ended up getting the house. But it's the whole name of claiming and that God is going to heal every disease, and God's going to solve every marital problem, and God's going to take care of every uh, confrontation that we face in our lives, and all of our problems are going to go away if we'll just have enough faith and, and pray hard enough. And we're not going to have to face these things. God's going to take care of it all. And God does help us. There is no doubt about it. Philippians chapter 4 Verses 6 through 8, where Paul encourages us to rejoice always. Again, I say rejoice. And he said to pray. Let's turn over there and read that. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And then he begins to talk about how our minds ought to be set on these good and lovely things. Verse 8. The peace of God which passes understanding is ours because we don't have to be anxious about anything. We don't have to worry. It doesn't mean that the problems are all going to go away, but it means that we have something better to look forward to and we can trust in that and we can live our lives focused on that and we can handle the things that get thrown our way. We can cast our care on God, 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 7. We can handle that. Because God is with us. He never leaves us. I will never leave you nor forsake you, Hebrews chapter 13. We are assured by our God. But there are those who can't handle the persecution or tribulation, 
and they are distracted and fall away. Matthew, the 13th chapter. Again, the explanation of the parable of the sower, verse 20. But he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Receive the word with joy. Start down the path that leads to life that few are going to find and, and then become distracted because bad things start to happen. Our, our obedience to the gospel didn't take away all the bad and so they let that get them down. We have to have root. That root is our faith. Revelation 2 and verse 10. Revelation chapter 2 and, and verse 10. Jesus is here speaking to the church in Smyrna. He says, Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. Literal, physical death is what they face. Jesus said, you persevere right up to that point, and I'll give you the crown of life. That's the assurance that we have. And that's the assurance that Paul had. Turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter. In verse 6, Paul says to Timothy, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. He knew that he was about to be executed. But notice what he says in verse 7. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearance. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And Paul did that in the face of persecution. And when you read 2 Corinthians chapter 11, if anybody went through persecution and trial and tribulation for the cause of Christ, it was Paul. And he was able to endure all of those things. And we can endure too. Don't allow tribulation and persecution problems and troubles and trials that come at us in life. Don't allow that to distract us from our goal. Spiritual pessimism is also a, a distraction. Turn with me to Numbers, the 13th chapter. Numbers, chapter 13. And we find that this is where Moses sends the spies into the land of Canaan. He sends the 12 spies and they Let's just read what they find. They've escaped, but God has delivered them from their Egyptian bondage. They're headed toward the promised land. They send the spies into that promised land, and here's what happens when they give the report. Verse 27, Then when they told him and said, We went to the land where you sent us, it truly flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anoth there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. The Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the banks of the Jordan. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we gave have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. There we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak came from the giants, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. God in heaven, who had delivered them from Egypt, they had seen the ten plagues. They had seen the Red Sea parted. They crossed over on the dry land. And those spies come out of that land of Canaan and tell the people that 
the giants are there and they live in fortified cities and we can't overcome them. They gave that negative report. And what was the result of that? Because of unbelief, they weren't able to enter the land is what we're told in Hebrews. They were forced to wander the wilderness for 40 years so that that generation died off and the next generation is the one that got to go into the land of promise. They were pessimistic. They didn't trust in God. Turn with you to Luke, the 14th chapter. Luke chapter 14, beginning in verse 25. And great multitudes went with him, Jesus. And he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? Lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes at him against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks the conditions of peace. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. We're supposed to count the cost before we begin to commit ourselves to Jesus. But we need to recognize that it is God. That it is God who helps us through. Philippians chapter 3, verse 12. Philippians the third chapter beginning in verse 12. Paul says, Not that I have already attained, talking about the resurrection of the dead, or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upper call of God in Christ Jesus. And then chapter 4, verse 13, he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Why would we be pessimistic? Why would we let that distract us? Why would we not trust our God? With God, all things are possible. Turn to Mark, the 10th chapter. Mark, chapter 10, and begin the reading with me in verse 23. The rich young rulers come to Jesus, want to know how to have eternal life, and Jesus says, you know the commandments and he said yeah I've kept them for my youth and Jesus said one thing you lack sell what you got go and distribute it to the poor and then come and follow him and he went away sorrowful and Jesus says in verse 23 and Jesus looked around and said to his disciples how hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God and the disciples were astonished at his words but Jesus answered again and said to them children how hard it is for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God and they were greatly astonished, saying among themselves, Who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, With men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God all things are possible. That rich young ruler could have gone to heaven if he had just gotten his heart right. Because with God all things are possible. We have to trust in God's promises. God cannot lie. Titus chapter 1. God has promised us eternal life and He cannot lie. Promise before time began. And when you read through the Scriptures and you see that over and over and over again God has kept His Word, we can trust God's promises. False teaching is a distraction. 2 Peter chapter 3. Many are led away by false doctrine. Many people doubt that, that it's even possible. That's not what the Scriptures teach. 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 14, Peter says we can actually look forward to the day of judgment. He says, Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by Him in peace, without spot and blameless. And consider that the longsuffering of our Lord is salvation as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, is written to you, 
as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, and which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the scriptures. They're un unstable people that twist the scriptures. Verse 17, he says, You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away from the air of the wicked. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. There are people who would live, lead us astray. We can fall from our own steadfastness. We can cease to believe the truth and be led away with lies like James chapter 5, verses 19 and 20 talks about. If anybody wanders from the truth and we turn him back, we've saved a soul from death and covered a multitude of sins, is what James tells us in. We can grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord, though. We don't have to be led away from false teaching. We don't have to be deceived. We know that the devil's devices, Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians. We're not ignorant of his devices and lies. It's how the devil operates. From the very beginning, John 8 verse 44 tells us. John 8 verse 32 tells us, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. We can know the truth. We can understand what the will of the Lord is, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 17. We can do it if we'll study to show ourselves approved. Workers who don't need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15 tells us. We have to keep our eyes on Jesus. We can't be distracted. If Peter kept his eyes on Jesus instead of looking around him and being distracted, he would have been able to make it to Jesus on that water. We'll keep our eyes on our goal, on our Lord and Savior. And His example, we can make it from here to heaven on that straight and narrow path. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1. The Hebrew writer says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For Jesus doing the will of God far surpassed the shame of the cross. The good that would come from what he was doing far surpassed the shame of the cross. He was made a little lower than the angels that he might taste that death for every man. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9 tells us he's the apostle and high priest of our confession. Chapter 3 and verse 1. We have to run with endurance. We're running a race. And it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. While we're here, we have to serve God. Fight the good fight. Lay hold on eternal life like Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6. And that takes endurance. Focusing on Jesus. Our confidence needs to be in God. Not in ourselves. We have to do our best, but the strength doesn't come from us. It's not any inherent uh, merit that we hold that saves us. It's God as we obey Him. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12, Paul says, Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. We have to be aware that we are engaged in spiritual warfare, 2 Corinthians chapter 10 tells us. We have to fight and trust in God. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 27, Paul said, I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I preach to others, I myself should become disqualified. We have to work at it and trust in God. James chapter 4, James chapter 4, beginning in verse 6. James says, but... He gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. I'm so thankful that it is not up to me to live a perfectly sinless life in order to make it to heaven. I'm so thankful that God sent His Son to die for us. Amen. That's what David said in the psalm. Turn with me back to Romans. Romans chapter 4. 
Verse 5. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness, just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and those whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. Now that does not mean that we don't have to obey God. That's not what it means at all. People misconstrue what, what it is that Romans teaches. It's to bring about, the, the point of the letter was to bring about, and Paul's apostleship was to bring about the obedience of faith. Obedience to the faith. Chapter 1 and verse 5. Same thing in chapter 16 and verses 25 and 26. That's the point of the letter. We are our slaves to that one whom we obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness in chapter 6. But it's by faith that we're saved and not by sinless, perfect law keeping. That was true of Abraham. That was true of those who lived in the Mosaic dispensation. It's true of us today. It's not sinless, perfect law keeping. It's by faith. It's by the blood of Jesus. And we work out our salvation with fear and trembling, as Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12 says. Shall we sin that grace may abound? Romans chapter 6, the beginning of that chapter, that's the point that that Paul's getting at in that chapter. So it's the objection that people are raising. Well, if you're saved by, by grace, if you're saved by faith, then we'll, and we need to sin then so that grace might abound. And Paul says, no. You're raised to walk in newness of life. It doesn't work that way. We have to obey God. But we trust in Him to save us, and it's through forgiveness. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us, Philippians chapter 4 and verse 13, and that means that we can serve God successfully. We can do what God wants us to do. He didn't give us a task that is beyond us. And He didn't leave us alone to try it. Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12, For this reason I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that He is able to keep what I have committed to Him until that day. And that's about trust. That's about pressing on in the face of persecution. That's about uh, Paul sitting in prison and saying this. He's not ashamed of what he did, of what he suffered, because he trusts in God. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. One more scripture and then the lesson here is Hebrews chapter 10, verse 35. The Hebrew writer says, Therefore do not cast away your confidence which has great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. We can do the will of God. Don't become distracted. Peter began to sink because he stopped focusing on Jesus and looked around. And we can sink too if we make that same mistake and don't do it. If you're here tonight and you're not a Christian, I encourage you to become one. Obey the gospel. Believe in Jesus. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3, 16. Believe in Jesus. If you don't do that, you can't be saved. But the passage doesn't say believe only. That's one passage that talks about our salvation. We need to look and see what the rest of the Scriptures say. We need to confess Jesus as well. Romans chapter 10 and verse 10. With the heart man believes unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Make that good confession. Repent of your sins. Change your mind. Change your life. Because Jesus said, you will perish if you don't. Luke chapter 13, verse 3. And then be baptized in water for the remission of your sins. Jesus said in Mark 16, 16, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. If you haven't done that, do it tonight. The Lord will add you to the church, which is the body of the saved. Ephesians 5, 23. You'll have the hope of eternal life. If you're here tonight and you've already named the name of Jesus and you've not lived your life as you ought to, you need to repent and we'll pray with you and for you and God will forgive you. You've got to be faithful until death, Jesus said in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10. Don't make the mistake of, of, of becoming distracted and, and falling away and living life short of what God expects from you and think that it's going to be okay. Repent and we'll pray with you and for you and God will forgive you. Whatever your need might be, won't you come forward and make it known while the other stands